Antonio, okay. take it away. Yeah. So, yeah. So, thank you for, thank you to everyone for attending this. And just a reminder so, this will be the last uh, talk for this semester. And uh, the, the report is due uh, Saturday, December 12th. And uh, yeah, so today's speaker is uh, Laurie Cranor, Distinguished Professor in Security and Privacy Technologies at the Scilab. And she directs uh, the usable privacy, usable privacy and Security Lab at uh, CMU. And so today's talk is about uh, lesson learned and future directions in the, in the field of uh, usable security and privacy. Okay. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen here. And all right. So um, yeah, so today uh, we're gonna talk about security and privacy for humans. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I'm part of the, the Scilab Security and Privacy Institute at Carnegie Mellon. I actually uh, direct the institute. Uh, I also teach in a number of um, different academic programs that we have at CMU. And if anybody has any questions about them, I'm, I'm happy to, to tell you about these programs. We have um, master's programs in privacy engineering and PhD programs in societal computing, um, which, which I teach in. All right, so let's jump in here. Um, we often hear about humans in the context of cybersecurity as the weakest link. Uh, we hear about human error, which uh, we blame for data breaches. Um, and, uh, and in fact, we, it's often said that uh, human error is one of the major causes of cyber attacks and data breaches. Um, but in traditional security classes, we don't spend a lot of time talking about who these terrible error prone humans actually are. Uh, so let's dig into the human threat. Um, what are we talking about? Uh, well, the, the most obvious uh, group of humans that we're talking about in the human threat is the malicious humans. And so we have, you know, Eve the evil attacker and Mallory the malicious and, and whatnot. Um, and so we do spend time uh, worried about those. But there are other types of humans who are also equally important when we're talking about a human threat. Uh, so we have clueless humans who don't realize that there are security tasks that they are supposed to be carrying out. They're unmotivated humans uh, who don't really view that security as part of their job. Why should they spend time uh, doing security tasks uh, when, when that's not in their job description? Uh, and then we have uh, humans who are constrained by human limitations, which is pretty much all of us. Uh, there are a number of security tasks that we are asked to do, such as memorizing lots of passwords, which are difficult uh, for, for most humans to do. And yet we keep asking humans to, to do these things. Uh, we also find that privacy uh, can be difficult for humans, not just security. Uh, and we keep hearing about different uh, types of privacy settings that, um, that people are having trouble with. Uh, some of the um, major services keep changing their privacy settings um, and sometimes they confuse people even more. Um, they change their privacy policies. Um, they, you know, they keep uh, trying to make them easier to understand, but there's a trade-off between granularity and complexity and actual ease of use because privacy is actually pretty complicated. Um, and so in our research at Carnegie Mellon, we've been looking at the usability side of both security and privacy. And what we've found is that it's best to look at all of these things together. Um, you know, there's a temptation to have the security people focus on security. And then uh, once they've built a tool, throw it over the fence to the usability people and have them you know, make it easy, make it work. Um, and uh, that tends not to work very well. It, it, uh, it's often most effective if we start thinking about the user interface and the usability as we're building the tools from the beginning. 
All right, so if we uh, look back to 1999, um, there was uh, a wonderful paper called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt, which um, has inspired a lot of the research that we have today on usable privacy and security. Uh, this was published at uh, USIX 1999, and um, about 20 years later, it won a, a Best of Time award um, at USNIC Security. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing, though, is that this paper presented the problem of users not being able to use email encryption tools uh, and talked about some of the, some of the um, ca underlying causes of this problem. And, you know, when we check in again 21 years later, we find out that, well, Johnny still can't encrypt. Uh, things actually aren't really all that much better. Um, and part of the reason for this is that we still rely on users to do security tasks that they really aren't very good at. Um, so I'm going to talk about two examples of this from my research. Uh, so we'll look at comparing crypto key fingerprints and creating unique and memorable passwords. So we'll start with the crypto key fingerprints. So when we have uh, people who are trying to communicate electronically and they want to do it securely, they, um, they need a way of uh, exchanging and verifying their crypto keys so that they know they're sending their secret message to the right person. Right. So we use public key cryptography and the public key looks something like this, only it's actually much longer than that. Um, and so we distill it down to a simple fingerprint, much smaller. And um, we have protocols that look something like this. Uh, the idea is that if I have one of these crypto keys and I um, want to distribute it securely to my communication partners, so they know it's me, then when I meet them face to face, I should give them my fingerprint. And so maybe I'll print it on my business card. Um, not a lot of people do this, but I do have a collection of business cards of people who've given me who, who do actually do this. Um, and then um, later when we're not face to face and I want to use a secure messaging app, um, I should be able to see their fingerprint on the secure messaging app and compare what's on the business card and make sure they match. Now, um, people who develop these sorts of systems have long ago realized that most people don't bother actually ever doing that comparison. Um, you know, even if they have the business card, they don't bother. And if they don't, you know, they, they don't uh, do the, well, I'll call someone up on the phone, listen to their voice, make sure I recognize them and do the comparison. Um, it's mostly not happening. Uh, so there's been some discussion that maybe it, people would be more likely to do it if we put it in a more inviting format. Um, and even if people do it, you know, they're not, attending to it very carefully. So maybe there's a different format of this that we could represent um, these, um, these codes in. And so maybe we could make a fingerprint instead of with numbers, maybe we could make it with words, or maybe we could make nonsense words, or maybe we could have ASCII art, or maybe we could have avatars inviting, involving unicorns because everybody loves unicorns, or maybe random artwork. Um, and there's been a lot of debate um, by people who have really no evidence one way or another as to which of these would be the best. Uh, so we decided to do a study to actually try to understand which of these approaches would actually work best. And we set it up as an online role-playing experiment. Uh, so we ended up recruiting over 600 participants and we told them that they were going to role play um, some tasks for an accountant. And the accountant was tasked with updating 30 employee social security numbers in a database. And so they had to send a secure message to each of 30 people to get their social security numbers. Um, and uh, in order to, to do this, they first needed to check a fingerprint to make before they actually transferred any social security number. Uh, so each participant in our study saw 30 fingerprints. Um, each person saw it in one format. We randomly distributed the, the formats among our participants. And we set it up so that when they saw these 30 fingerprints, unbeknownst to them, one of them would actually be an attack. It would not actually be a matching fingerprint. Uh, we experimented with five text formats, three graphical formats, 
And this is what it looked like to our participants. So on the left side, they see a computer screen. And on the right side, they have a, um, a picture of a desktop where they have a stack of business cards. And you can see here, um, th this is a comparison of, um, of a numeric code. And the, the participant is supposed to be comparing the numeric code in the window to the one on the business card. And they're also given some time pressure here. Okay, so um, fast forwarding to the results, not too surprising, people are not good at this. It actually doesn't really matter what format you give them, they're really not good at this. Um, we found that people missed a lot of the attacks that we gave them. Um, the, the various text formats, the, it was about equal as far as which, you know, how likely they were to miss the attacks. Um, we found with the graphical formats, there were some that were better or worse than others. I should really say they were mostly some were worse than others. They were all bad, but some were, were terrible. Um, some of them were faster to do the comparison. Um, none of them performed well, and my friend the unicorn was actually among the worst. Um, and it turned out that, that people just made a lot of errors comparing the unicorns. Um, you know, the different unicorns varied according to the color of the unicorn, the background, you know, what direction the horn was pointing in, things like that. Um, but people would look and go, yep, two unicorns and, and say they matched even when um, they did not. Okay, so uh, fingerprints, this seems to be a task that people are not good at. Uh, it doesn't really matter what form we put them in. Um, we really need to find a better way to facilitate this secure communication and not rely on comparing the crypto key fingerprints. Let's look at another task and we'll look at creating unique and memorable passwords. Um, many of us had hoped that we would not need to keep doing this. In fact, Bill Gates, um, about uh, 16 years ago, had predicted the death of passwords. Sadly, Bill was wrong. Um, uh, passwords may uh, go into extinction eventually, but not this year. Um, so uh, you know, we, we wonder, what can we do to make the best of the situation that we still have all of these uh, passwords? Um, and uh, they're getting cracked and guessed all the time. Uh, so we've been looking at user behavior while they create passwords and the types of passwords that people create. We've done a number of studies. Uh, and one of the things that jumps out is that uh, a lot of users have misconceptions about passwords. Uh, so for example, in one study we did in our lab where we had people create passwords, um, we found that, that a lot of people thought that keyboard patterns are really secure they would show us, oh, I've got this really great trick for creating random passwords. You know, it's just you know, diagonal on the keyboard. Um, of course, we know this is not really random. And um, if you look at lists of cracked passwords, you see that these, these passwords uh, pop up all the time. And not just the one you know, on the left side of the keyboard, which is by far the most popular one, but, but pretty much any um, keyboard pattern that you might come up with is on the list in cracking dictionaries. Uh, another thing that we see is that people have been trained that they need to put symbols in their passwords. And it turns out that the exclamation point is a very appealing symbol. Everybody likes to use it and everybody likes to use it at the end of their password. Um, and we found in our study that people would say, okay, I'm creating a password and you know, my password is the name of my dog. And I know that's not really very secure. So I'll make it more secure by just adding an exclamation point on the end. Um, this is of course not uh, secure. Uh, after attackers run through the dictionary, they then run through all the words in the dictionary with an exclamation point on the end. Um, and then if that doesn't work, they run through with a number one on the end. Um, so there are definitely misconceptions here about what makes for a secure password. Uh, we did another study, we did this online, um, where we showed people pairs of passwords and we asked them to indicate uh, which was more secure or whether they were equally secure. And uh, so here's an example. If we were in the same room, I would have you all try it by raising your hands, but uh, sadly, we're not gonna be able to do that. Um, but we showed them a pair of words such as I love you 88 and I eat kale 88. And um, most people assume that they're equally secure. They're the same number of letters, same number of numbers. In fact, it's they start with the same letter, they end with the same numbers. Um, why wouldn't these be equally secure? 
Uh, well, it turns out actually that I Eat Kale 88 is like 4 trillion times more secure than I Love You 88. And the reason for this is that I Love You is a very common string to put in passwords. I Eat Kale is not. Um, kale is not popular, especially in my house among my children. Uh, I eat kale, but <laughs> it doesn't seem like anybody else does. So um, once you know that there are certain types of strings, such as I love you, that are very popular, uh, that can help you reason about whether your password is likely to be cracked or not. Um, but most members of the general public are not really aware of this. And it turns out that most password meters out there are not really helping them. Uh, so this is a typical password meter and uh, it will tell you things like, your password is weak, create a stronger password, right? That doesn't really help me. Um, or you know, maybe it will tell me add a symbol and you know, I'll add the exclamation point at the end. So we developed a password meter in our lab that was based on our research results. Uh, so uh, this is an improvement on many of the password meters out there because first of all, it more accurately measures the strength of the passwords. But secondly, it gives actually actionable advice based on the password that the person has typed in. So it will say things like consider inserting digits into the middle, not just at the end, if you've added your digits at the end. Uh, so we've done some studies to validate that this is a useful approach and we have demos online uh, on our website. Uh, more recently, we had a paper at the ACMCCS conference um, where based on, and at this point it's actually 10 years of research, um, we are able to actually make some practical recommendations for stronger and more usable passwords. Um, the, the most recommended approach uh, from, from our studies is that you use, um, a you, you use something based on our password meter. So the way we were able to implement our password meter was that we actually used neural networks to uh, evaluate the strength of a password um, and then um, use heuristics to provide feedback. It turns out that uh, you're, we were able to um, use neural networks to evaluate passwords quickly and with a very small amount of code. So you can do it client side and you don't need to send this password um, over the internet. Um, and in, it, instead of telling users, you know, you're required to make your password, you know, 15 characters long and have an uppercase letter, lower digit symbol, Instead, you can say you're required to have your password reach a certain score on the password meter. And um, that actually seems to be a better approach that results in stronger passwords and less aggravated users. Uh, so that, that was our big takeaway. Uh, we also found that, that very large blacklists can also be a good approach, um, not quite as good, but, but that, that's also um, a viable approach. Complicated rules for passwords, though, does not really seem to be the best approach. All right, so another problem that we've seen is that users cope with having lots of passwords by reusing them. Rather than creating a new password for every website they visit, they just reuse passwords they already had. Um, so we knew this was a problem, but we wanted to collect some data to really understand it. Uh, so we have uh, a, a system at Carnegie Mellon called the Security Behavior Observatory. And what we've done here is we have recruited uh, home Windows computer users, and we've given them software to install on their home computers that is collecting data and sending it to us. Um, we had uh, at any given time about 200 active participants uh, who would stay uh, in the system for a few months or in some cases even a couple of years uh, sending us their data. Um, this was pretty cool because we had natural observation about what they were doing on their computers and we uh, especially uh, were collecting data related to security and privacy. Um, and we were able to follow up with these people with either interviews or surveys so that we could align what they thought they were doing with what we found out about what they were actually doing. So one of the types of data that we were collecting is hashed passwords. 
And uh, from this, we were able to um, draw uh, a lot of interesting conclusions about people's use of passwords. Um, so in particular, we were looking at password reuse. And what we found is that on average, uh, participants in our study had 26 different accounts that they accessed through their web browser on this Windows computer. Um, and among those 26 different accounts, they only had 10 distinct passwords, right? So uh, a lot of these accounts were using the same password as another one of, of their accounts. And we actually drilled down more deeply and we found that um, sometimes people exactly reuse their passwords and sometimes they partially reuse them. So they'll have monkey and monkey one and monkey two and monkey three. Well, half the passwords out there were actually both exactly reused and partially reused. So they would have monkey multiple times, but they'd also have monkey one and monkey two multiple times. Um, so half the passwords, that was the situation. 16% um, were only exactly reused, 12% were only partially reused. And we only had about 20% of passwords that were not being reused. Uh, so then we wondered, well, maybe people are just reusing their, their throwaway passwords for accounts they don't really care about. You know, surely they can't be doing this for their financial accounts. Uh, so then we broke this down based on the type of website people were visiting, and we found that people re were reusing across pretty much every type of website, including their shopping sites, their financial sites, um, educational work-related sites, all of that. And this password reuse is a problem because attackers are exploiting password reuse. So an attacker who has gained access to a list of passwords um, is then going to try those passwords at other um, websites because they realize that many users are, are reusing their passwords. So they see Jim's password is monkey one, and then they'll go to other sites and try monkey one there. And then if that doesn't work, they may try monkey two at that other site uh, as well. And so this is a, a big problem. And we've actually seen a lot of evidence of this happening in the wild. Um, one of the reasons why users are coping by um, reusing passwords is because they have to change their passwords so frequently. So not only do they have 29 different accounts or more, but on many of these accounts, every 30, 90, however many days, they're actually asked to change their password. And uh, it's, it seems to be the case though, that having users change their passwords is not really all that effective. Um, there are a bunch of campaigns like this, that passwords were like underpants, change them frequently. Um, but I really don't like this because I don't, I don't think from the evidence that all of this password changing is really very helpful. So why is it that we are requiring password changes? Well, the idea is that if somebody has gotten your password and you were unaware of it, then um, uh, if you change your password, then they will be locked out. Um, that's the theory. Uh, that theory has not really held up well in practice though. Uh, so uh, there was a study that was done at the University of North Carolina um, about 10 years ago uh, at UNC, there was a requirement that people change their password every three months. And so researchers there were able to obtain the defunct passwords, the ones that people were no longer using. Uh, they, were, they obtained them in, in a hash form and they had to crack them. Um, so uh, they wondered um, if we crack one password, can we then guess the next one? Um, and so uh, what they did is they, they uh, cracked uh, a large number of passwords and then they started uh, running some machine learning algorithms over them and trying to learn uh, how people transform their passwords from one to the next. And they found that people were doing things like this. They would uh, take lowercase letters in their password and then in the next one, they would make it uppercase. They would take numbers and they would increment them. Uh, they would take numbers and they would switch them to the symbol on the same key. Um, and then this wasn't in the study, but we've observed in our studies that people will actually tack the date of the password change on the end. So if I know I'm changing my password quarterly, um, then um, I might put the, the month and the year uh, on the end of the password. And so every time I have a unique password, but I can remember it very easily. 
Uh, so it turns out, though, that attackers can guess this very easily. So they simulated an online attack where the attacker ha would have only five guesses. And if the attacker knew um, your last password, they had a 17% chance of finding your next password within five guesses. Um, they also simulated an offline attack um, where the attacker has you know, unlimited number of guesses, but they're limited by their CPU power and time. And so you know, they gave themselves three seconds on a processor from 10 years ago, and they were able to crack 41% of passwords. And presumably with um, a faster processor or more time, they would be able to crack more. Um, so this shows that um, if we assume that by changing our password, we are going to lock the attackers out, that doesn't actually seem to be the case. Um, that in fact, um, most of us are changing our passwords in pretty predictable ways. Uh, so when I was uh, working at the FTC a few, a few years ago, um, I was very frustrated because I suddenly found myself with lots of government passwords that had to be changed very frequently. And, um, and it just didn't like seem sensible that this was required. Um, and so I went and talked to people who ran our IT systems um, and I made my arguments to them. I showed them the research data um, and they, they actually thought it was pretty compelling. Uh, so then I wrote um, an article which was on the front page of the FTC website, uh, arguing that we should rethink mandatory password changes. And that got a lot of press attention. It wasn't just me saying this around the same time. Um, there were uh, experts in other countries, including the UK, that were saying basically the same thing. Um, and, uh, and then eventually in 2017, NIST changed their recommendations about passwords. Previously, NIST had recommended the password expiry rules and they, they backed down from that and said, no, actually, that's not such a good idea. All right, so uh, if changing your passwords doesn't really help, what can work? Well, two things that do seem to be uh, fairly uh, effective are two-factor authentication and password managers. Uh, so we um, did a study looking at why um, two-factor adoption is pretty low. Uh, these numbers actually are a bit out of date, but it's still, uh, it's still pretty low as far as how many people adopt two-factor if they're not forced to do so. So CMU uh, adopted uh, Duo two-factor authentication a couple of years ago on campus. And so we collected data and surveyed students, faculty, and staff before and after the mandatory adoption deadline. Um, the version of Duo that, that we adopted at CMU um, involved um, uh, people uh, having to request a push and then they could use their, their mobile device to press a button um, and accept the code. Um, there was a remember me for 30 days feature as part of our system, which uh, actually made it a lot more convenient than some of the other implementations I've seen at other universities that, that don't have this feature. Okay, so we collected lots of data um, from people and um, we found some, some interesting things. So one thing was that students perceived two-factor much more negatively than faculty and staff. And when we looked into the reason for this, we found that the Remember Me for 30 Days feature uh, works really well if you're always using the same devices. So that was me in my office at the time. Um, wow, it's been a while since so I've been there. Um, but uh, you know, I was always using the same computer in my office. And so I only had to do this um, two-factor authentication really once every 30 days. But students were going into the computer lab where they might be using a different computer every time. And so every time they went to the computer lab, they were having to authenticate. Um, we also found that people who had used two-factor before on other services were much more likely to think it was okay. Uh, people who hadn't used it needed convincing. Um, you know, people thought that they didn't really have anything that was important enough that to warrant using two-factor, um, or they'd heard from other people that it was a pain and they were like, yeah, it's pain, pain for other people. Why should I bother? It's, it's quite the hassle. But when we surveyed people after they had been forced to adopt it, adopt it and they'd been using it for a while, uh, it turned out not to be so bad. And we got a lot of responses like this one where they said, hey, actually, it's not that horrible. Okay, that's not a ringing endorsement, um, but it actually shows that you can get people to use two-factor and, and in fact, it's not horrible. 
And then most of the people who, who had really negative experiences with it, um, there were particular corner cases that were causing them problems. Um, and they were things that um, uh, hopefully are solvable. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't actually need to, be, to subject them to, to those problems. Um, so it seems like this is a, a good approach and we just need to get more people to use it. Um, password managers are another good approach, and we hear from a lot of experts that, um, that that's the solution. Um, I know I use a password manager. I, I adopted one a few years ago, and have, you have never looked back. You know, this, this is great. I don't have to um, go through lots of efforts to try to come up with creative new passwords, and I don't have to put any effort into remembering them. But password managers are also something that are not widely adopted. Um, and even when they are adopted, we see that a lot of people use password managers as convenience to uh, store their bad passwords so they don't have to keep typing them in. Um, the way you should use a password manager is to actually randomly generate your passwords um, and then store them. Um, so we looked into why was it that uh, adoption rates were so low. We found that some people actually were just completely unaware of the existence of password managers. Um, some people knew about them, but didn't think that what they were doing right now, reusing their passwords was really a bad thing. They didn't really see the risk in that. Um, we also had people who said, well, but the password manager could be compromised which is true, it could, um, but they were weighing the risk of password manager compromise as, as a much bigger risk than the risk of compromise of a reused password. Um, and in most cases, uh, it's probably the opposite that's true. Uh, we did have some people who tried to use password managers and found them confusing, which is also a problem. Um, they they uh, don't always uh, do things the way you expect them to, and, and uh, many of them could use user interface improvements. Um, so uh, what we also saw was that a lot of people who are using password managers are using them that are built into their web browser. Um, those tend to be the easiest to use and pretty convenient, uh, but those people especially were using them entirely out of convenience and were just storing their bad passwords there. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about privacy. Um, and uh, let's start with um, talking about privacy policies and nutrition labels. And then we'll talk a bit about online tracking icons. All right, so this is a typical privacy policy. Nobody reads them. Um, we uh, did a study uh, over 10 years ago now where we looked at how long it would take people to read them. You know, just imagine that people really did want to stop and read privacy policies at every website they visited. How long would it take? And we came up with this ridiculous estimate of 244 hours per year. Um, so clearly, if we are expecting that people read privacy policies in order to protect their privacy, well, it's no wonder that we don't have much privacy. And we weren't the first ones or the only ones to say this. Uh, this was a White House report that said only in some fantasy world do users actually read these. Um, so uh, pretty clear that privacy policies in their current form are not the solution to improving privacy or at least not on their own. Um, we, we did a study to see whether, we, whether information about privacy could actually influence people to be more privacy protective. And so we developed this um, prototype of a search engine where all the search results are annotated with privacy information in the form of a privacy meter. And so then the question is, if you did a search and you saw these sorts of search results, would you be more attracted to the search results that had better privacy? And what we found was in fact, people are. Um, we, I don't have time to go into the details about how we did the study, but basically we had people make purchases and people were actually willing to make purchases that were slightly more expensive when they knew the website had a better privacy policy and when they saw that in the search results. Uh, we actually did the same um, uh, experiment where we put the privacy meter on the website itself and the top um, rather than in the search results. And we found it had no effect if you put it on the website. It had to be in the search results before you had decided which uh, website to, to visit and purchase from. 
Um, so another thing that uh, people have, have suggested might actually help with uh, privacy online is um, having a privacy nutrition label. Um, we have nutrition labels on food items that make it very difficult, that make it much easier to um, compare um, the nutrition of food, which would otherwise be difficult. Um, so could we do the same thing with privacy? And um, we would hope that a privacy nutrition label would be standardized um, and it would help people um, uh, learn um, where to find information about privacy. Uh, it would be brief and it would be linked to more information. So we came up with uh, this uh, privacy nutrition label for websites, um, which we did some studies and tested and it was uh, very effective. Uh, we've also done um, similar studies with a nutrition label for Android apps. Um, and interestingly, um, now this is seven years after our Android app uh, nutrition label study was published just this week. Apple has come out with uh, privacy nutrition labels for the the um, Apple uh, App Store. Uh, so finally, there seems to be some interest in actually doing this sort of thing. Um, we're also seeing interest in nutrition labels for IoT devices. And so we've seen um, some legislative proposals and we've seen in other countries, they're actually uh, drafting proposals and adopting uh, IoT privacy and security labels. So we started looking into um, whether this might make sense in the US. We came up with a mock-up of a label and we did a user study with consumers who had purchased IoT devices to see whether this sort of information would be helpful to them. Uh, and what we found is that uh, people were very interested in this sort of information. Um, but we asked them what they would like to see on the label specifically, and they didn't really know because you know, they're not experts in security and privacy. Uh, here's a, a mock-up of, of how this label might look um, on an appliance. Um, we did a follow-up study with experts and we asked experts what, uh, what a label should look like. And experts had a lot of things to tell us. They came up with 47 different items that they might like to see on a label. And that seemed like that would be overwhelming. So what we did is we split the label into two layers. So the top layer, the one on the left, is what we would actually put on the packaging of a device or on the website. And then you could click through or scan the QR code to get to the secondary layer, which would have all of the gory details. Um, but the information on the primary layer is the information that we think would be most useful to consumers. And we've done some consumer testing with that. Um, you can check out the label on our website, IoT Security Private privacy.org. We have a label uh, generator wizard there and uh, lots of other interesting uh, info. Okay, let's take a look at online tracking icons. So um, this is this is humor. This is from The Onion. Um, but I have had many friends who have complained about this, that they uh, have shoes that follow them through shoe ads wherever they go online. They keep seeing these shoes on every website and um, they're being stalked by shoe ads and they don't know how to stop it. And I myself have been stalked by shoe ads too, except I actually know how to stop it uh, because I'm aware of this little icon that's in the corner of most of these ads. It's a little blue triangle thing. Blow it up for you, it looks like that. Uh, but it turns out that most people are not aware of this. Um, they, many, many people have seen it. They don't really know what it is or they have misconceptions about it. And many people have not really even, uh, are not even really aware that they've seen it even though it's actually been in ads for almost 10 years now. Uh, so we, we uh, conducted a study uh, back in I guess, 2011 um, to see what people thought of this icon and what they thought it meant. So we did this as an online study and uh, we had different conditions. We put people in where we showed them an ad with a tagline and an icon. Um, half the people saw the actual ad choices icon and half saw this um, 
uh, different icon which had been proposed and then discarded. Uh, and then we, uh, we showed them the word add choices, which is what usually appears next to it. But we also showed them other things that could appear. Um, some ads actually say things like interest-based ads or why did I get this ad? So we included those. Um, and then we made up a bunch of other potential taglines, some of which we thought might be good and some of which we were pretty sure were not good. Um, and so each person was shown an ad with a tagline and an icon. And then we asked them a bunch of questions about it. So for example, we asked them, what would happen if you clicked on the icon? And um, what we found is that when we showed this, this particular combination, most people had, had a wrong idea. Um, more than half of the people thought that more ads will pop up, which is completely wrong. Um, only 27% of people had the correct answer, which is that this will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Now, when we changed it up with a different tagline, for example, configure ad preferences, we actually did a lot better. Um, so here we, we went from 27% correct to actually 50% correct. Right, that's still like pretty bad. You'd, you'd fail my class that way, but um, it is a significant improvement. And it suggests that if the ad industry actually wanted to communicate, they could probably continue to refine this and come up with something that would communicate to people better than their particular icon and tagline. Uh, we've also uh, looked at um, the opt-out choices on websites. Um, you know, most people don't read privacy policies, but if they do read them, usually the reason they're interested in them is to find out what choices they have. And what we found in our studies, we, we examined 150 websites, we found that it's actually really hard to find the opt-outs on many websites and it takes many steps. Um, we also found there's a lot of inconsistency about how these choices are presented. They use different words, different headings, um, and um, that, that uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to even you know, like search a website and find these things because of the differences in wording that they're using. Um, we're continuing to do work in this direction to try to figure out how to fix this problem. Uh, and you know, a lot of the solutions that we're looking at involve standardizing things, you know, using uh, standardized computer, computer readable um, privacy information um, and mechanisms, but also even just standard language and standard icons. And we uh, recently did a study looking at the uh, CCPA, which is the, the California privacy law. Um, and uh, we came up with a bunch of um, icons that they could use uh, for compliance with that law. We evaluated them and we made um, a recommendation to, to the California Attorney General, um, which we, um, uh, they, they've expressed some interest in. We're waiting to see exactly what happens with that. All right, so uh, what we've seen is that uh, some of the problems that I've discussed are not just technology problems, they're problems having to do with design, usability, and even public policy. Um, and so I wanna take a minute to talk about some of the research approaches that we've used um, to try to address uh, some of these issues. And um, you know when I when I talk about uh, usable privacy and security research, one question people ask me is, well, isn't this just like HCI studies? How how are these studies any different than um, the normal usability studies, or are they any different? And uh, I think you know in many ways they aren't different, but where they do differ is the presence of a risk or an adversary. Uh, so in your typical HCI study, um, you may ask users to do tasks and you see how well they do it, but you're not attacking them while they're doing the task. Um, but in a uh, usable security study, sometimes you are. Actually, we usually aren't actually attacking them. We are simulating an attack or an adversary. Um, we also have the issue that uh, unless we're dealing with uh, studies of security experts, most people are not purposely setting out to do security tasks. It's a secondary task that they have to do in order to get to what they really want to do with their computer. Um, so this presents a challenge and the question of how can we design legal and ethical studies that allow us to observe users in realistic scenarios being exposed to risk. And so I'm going to tell you about kind of three different approaches that we take. 
One is to observe real world activity. Uh, this is great when you can do it, uh, you can get naturally occurring risk, um, but it's actually really difficult to get people to let you look over their shoulder as they do their, um, all of their computer tasks. Uh, it's also usually not conducive to a controlled experiment. And we find that while people get attacked all the time, any one person is not being constantly attacked. And so you have to watch people for a while before you can actually witness an attack and how they respond to it. Uh, so the, um, the, the study we did uh, at CMU with DUO is an example of a real world observation study uh, where, where we were able to collect data on the adoption of, uh, of two-factor authentication. The Security Behavior Observatory is another example. Um, this one was actually really hard to do. We had to uh, put a lot of effort into recruiting and maintaining this set of users who would allow us to constantly collect their data. So uh, if you don't have access to a population that will let you watch them all the time, um, you can bring people to your lab or recruit them online to observe them doing some hypothetical security tasks. And then you can add some risk to it, um, except we still are not allowed to actually hurt participants in our study. Um, and so we generally are adding some simulated risk uh, to our, our studies. And often we do this using deception and we then debrief the participants at the end about what really happened. Now, since this is hypothetical, people may be more alert to security issues than is, is natural. Um, so the, the study I told you about um, using um, the, the crypto key fingerprints is an example. We gave people a hypothetical security task where they had to compare these fingerprints and we were able to observe their behavior. Um, another approach is to observe non-security tasks. Um, and so this can distract people from uh, focusing on security. Um, but they're still doing tasks that they've been told to do as part of a study. It's not the real tasks that they're, that they're actually doing. Uh, so an example of this is a study that we did over 10 years ago on browser phishing warnings. Uh, so we were interested in comparing the, um, the phishing warnings in the web browsers of the time, and this was back in 2007. Um, and so this was a deception study. We recruited people for a study on online shopping and they came to our lab. We um, asked them to purchase a box of paper clips on Amazon because um, they're cheap. Uh, then we gave them a real survey about shopping that was actually for another study. And then we fished them. Um, so we sent, we asked them to check their email and get the receipt for their paper clips so that we could reimburse them. Um, and when they went there, they would see our phishing email um, and they uh, almost all of them fell for it. And so our email looked like this. We faked it to look like it came from Amazon and we told them there was some delay in their order and they needed to do something quickly. Um, and we gave them a link and this was the link we gave them. It was to amazonaccounts.net. Um, which, you know, to an expert, you know, it's, it's clearly not Amazon um, and we didn't hide it. It was right there in the email, but most people uh, clicked on it anyway. So we successfully fished most of the people in the study. Um, and then when, once we fished them, their browser would trigger a warning about phishing and some of them would then close their browser and, um, and give up and others would then you know, continue proceeding to the website anyway. Um, and we found there were significant differences depending on which web browser they were using and therefore which of the warnings that they saw. Um, so this was really interesting and it allowed us to understand some of the reasons that people were falling for phishing attacks and why they were ignoring the browsing warnings. So for example, one thing we saw is that people thought that amazonaccounts.net was actually a genuine address. They really didn't know how to look critically at a URL and know whether it was legit or not. Um, we also found that some people, after they closed their web browser, they would actually go click on the link again and the warning would pop up and they'd close their web browser again and they would keep repeating this cycle. 
Um, and and actually, uh, uh, th this was really interesting. We didn't quite know why they were doing this. And so we started asking them why they were doing that. Um, and what we learned is that their mental model was that when things pop up in your web browser, it usually means something is temporarily broken and you just kind of reload or you know open it again and, and it will work itself out. Um, it didn't occur to them that this had anything to do with the link that was in their email. Um, they were focused on you know, this error in their web browser. Uh, so our research actually did lead to better phishing warnings um, that were adopted uh, by most of the major browser vendors. So that was pretty exciting. All right, let me wrap things up so I have time for a few questions here. Um, so what is next in the usable privacy and security space? Um, I think we're going to be seeing more interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, a lot of the work that I've done involved not only computer scientists and usability experts, but you know, psychologists and economists. And I, th I think that um, uh, in order to, to really understand these things, we do need these sorts of interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, I think to see some of our solutions actually implemented and deployed may require uh, regulatory incentives. Um, you know, things like the privacy nutrition labels are really unlikely to get adopted unless there is pressure from regulators or perhaps even laws changed that require some of these things. Um, I think we're going to see more use of machine learning um, to customize security and privacy tools to make them more usable and to help defend against attacks, um, just like we're seeing machine learning applied to everything these days. Um, and I think we're gonna see efforts to try to make security and privacy tools that work without human intervention. Um, that's kind of in some ways the ideal solution, like just make it so easy that you don't have to do anything, um, but we can't always do that. And I will uh, end with a, a picture of some of my students who contributed uh, to this work and our lab unicorn, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, I think we have uh, some questions on the on the chat. So I, I'm not sure if you can read them or I can read them for you. Uh, yeah, I can read them. Um, all right, so from Jeremiah. Hi, Jeremiah. Yeah. Um, let's see, in your security behavior observatory, did participants self-report the value of different accounts? Did password strength strongly or weakly correlate with the value of the account? Um, no, that was a question we had, um, but not, not something that we were able to investigate um, in this study. Um, so we were only able to use kind of a proxy uh, for that, which was the category of account that it was. Um, so we know that it's an account at a bank versus um, uh, an account, you know, at an entertainment site or something like that. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I don't think we found much of any correlation between account type and password strength. Um, next question also from Jeremiah. Um, Crypto key fingerprints. Are there attack patterns that humans are more or less likely to detect? Uh, E.g. errors beginning middle. If so, do these patterns give us any insights into how the mechanism can be improved? Yeah, so um, we, we do think that there are some um, that they're more, more likely to detect. We weren't able to thoroughly explore that, um, but uh, in our preliminary studies, um, uh, we did some experiments with that. And when we, uh, when we did the attacks, um, we wanted to have a realistic attack. Um, and so we selected attacks where it wasn't just like a completely random and totally different fingerprint. Um, we picked attacks that were uh, similar to the original fingerprint. And um, we assumed that the attacker would do things like make the first few characters and the last few characters the same. And so we, um, we made some estimates as to what would be a reasonable amount of computation that an attacker might um, put into coming up with the fake fingerprint. And then um, we generated uh, fingerprints using that amount of, of computation and, um, and then you know, picked the best, the best uh, one um, and used that in our attack. Um, uh, so so uh, we, we assume that a sophisticated attacker would do something like that. 
um, does that help us figure out how they can be improved? Um, uh, I mean, it, it basically suggests that, that if you can come up with a fingerprint that doesn't allow people to rely on kind of the easy heuristics, like if it doesn't have a beginning and end, um, then, then uh, people will be forced to look in the middle. Um, but it, yeah, so, so if you could come up with something like that, uh, maybe it would help. Um, but I think in general, uh, given the different number of different um, approaches we tried and how bad they all were, I would suggest looking to other solutions beyond crypto key fingerprints. All right, let's see. I see a question from Alex. Um, are the results of the privacy study published uh, or do you have a link you can share? Yes, actually the results of everything that I talked about are published. They are on um, the CUPS Lab website. Um, so cups.cs.cmu.edu. Um, that particular study, the title is The Cost of Reading Privacy Policies and Alicia McDonald is the first author. Uh, Chris, hi Chris. Uh, have you looked at usability of identity authentication mechanisms other than passwords, other than Duo 2FA approach? Um, I have done um, a little bit with um, smartphone biometrics, um, but beyond that, I personally have not looked at the usability of other approaches. Um, we did. We did the smartphone biometrics study um, a few years ago um, when the biometrics on the phones weren't as good as what you have on current phones. Um, and what we found there was um, uh, face detection was pretty unusable, largely because it failed if you didn't have bright lights. Um, so any kind of low lighting condition didn't work too, too well. Um, and the uh, fingerprint um, uh, was, was better at the time. Um, although in our study, we actually had people trying to do it while they were carrying things or after having put on hand lotion and things like that. And so uh, there definitely were like, you know, real world constraints that that made those things harder to use. Um, but uh, like I said, this was a few years ago. And I think that um, the current smartphone biometrics actually work a lot better. Okay. Just a I think we have a we have a, a question on the other chat. Did you find any correlation with the complexity of the password with the age of the participants? Uh, um, so we um, we we haven't looked at that in in all of our studies. Um, we did one study. Um, a while ago with Carnegie Mellon um, students, uh, faculty and staff and their passwords. Um, and we did find that um, there were differences. I, I don't think we found age differences. We found there were differences based on what college people were associated with. Um, so we found that the people in our business school had the worst passwords. Um, and people in the School of Computer Science had the best passwords. Uh, and yeah, everybody thought the art students were gonna have the worst passwords. Those were actually in the middle. Um, so there, there are some uh, demographic trends. Um, those aren't super strong though. Okay. So if we don't have any other question, I think uh, I can say thank you to the speaker. And uh, thank you to all the students that have participated to this uh, class of seminars for this semester. Okay, bye, bye. Bye.